Now, we don't have to accept Adnan's request in terms of, because actually I spent six hours last night preparing because he gave me a challenge, which probably was more or less easy because I've done a lot of stuff for the last 11 years on artificial intelligence. And also another domain of interest to me is the future of universities, because I've been working on the future since 1990 for a long, long time. Nowadays, we're talking about exponential change and uh, incredible, but I've been talking about the future, uh, future research for, you know, over uh, 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 34 years, I mean, you know. So, um, in several domains, biometrics, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, the future of universities, marketing, management, etc. Um, always, and I like, you know, unlike uh, Adnan, um, I can do all these things because never married, I don't have a wife, I just work, 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 you know, I actually enjoyed what I do, and people apparently are kind enough to enjoy what I do and invite me. I just, last week I was in France, uh, a few weeks ago I was in Tunisia, so whatever, uh, etc. But, um, so he gave me a challenge, he said, oh, it would be nice for you to talk about uh, how artificial intelligence is changing the world of universities. So, that was the challenge that he gave me. So, okay, fine, because I have lots of things, but not combined, just combined. So I spent six hours uh, working for Sarah, not you, you're not Edinburgh, <laughs> she's and uh, it's Edinburgh. But he does not even know what is the rampant lion flag. Not unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> Glasgow much older than Edinburgh anyway. Uh, so, so I did that. I combined. It was easy for me because I've got lots of stuff, recent stuff on presentations I've done on artificial intelligence and also about the future of universities. So I combined them. But again, uh, that was Adnan's request. I mean, I, can, I don't need PowerPoints. I can be here talking to you about whatever you want. Uh, well, within the my first, or if you want, we can talk about, um, you know, few shot models and uh, no coding and whatever, uh, smart language models, whatever you want. I mean, you know. Uh, so it's up to you, Sarah. What you want? So I think the university would be the most yeah, part of You want that? Okay. Faculty, yeah. So it's it's incredible. I mean, just to give you an idea, in Portugal. Um, just came out the statistics last week. 30% of the people that finish with an undergraduate degree, they leave Portugal. They go to Switzerland, most to Holland, uh, in Netherlands, etc. So there's a huge brain drain. Um, uh, and they get, you know, people that stay in Portugal, these young, very good minds, they get salaries less than 1,000 euros, which is ridiculous. So we cannot compete. So we, I think that is an, an issue that is actually enforcing a university to think in a different way and open their minds in a different way. Um, so, future generations as well, higher education, students need to lead the way. And we're talking about, you know, uh, forget about the millennials, we're talking about generations like the alpha generation, the COVID generation, the, the resilient generation, they have different expectations. They starting at two years of age with screens. They are a screen-based generation. And of course, they, they want. And of course, they want to find, and they can find uh, chunks of knowledge, chunks of learning themselves, sometimes much better than the lecturer or, or, the, or the person that is there. So clearly, um, and also they privilege these uh, uh, interaction, human machine, etc. So uh, again, the the issue about generation. So emerging technologies is actually becoming very preponderant uh, in terms of the higher education, um, simulations, artificial intelligence, and all sorts of haptic technology, holographics, holograms, etc. All that is coming to shape, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of them is actually led by artificial intelligence. I gave a seminar um, when I arrived. The day I arrived, at 5 o'clock in the morning. At 11 o'clock, I was giving a seminar to staff, faculty, about the use of artificial intelligence for academic research. So I was telling Salman, and he was laughing, uh, when I did my PhD in the 70s, and I'm okay, you know, I'm okay still in terms of health-wise, and I'm here bouncing and, and uh, mind-stretching you and all that, I actually use very sophisticated statistical modeling, not just cluster analysis or whatever, but I use small space analysis, multidimensional analysis, the scaling analysis, with mainframe 
add perforated cards. Nowadays, my God, you can do, I'm not just talking about using R, hopefully not using SPSS, but you have all sorts of platforms to help you with literature review, mostly artificial intelligence led, with generating hypotheses, with research design, with data analysis, with simulation, with finding the right references, uh, with peer reviews. I mean, unbelievable. So you are lucky. Huh? So clearly, <clears throat> AI in our higher education, it's actually a revolution. Unbelievable. This is actually moving so fast, so fast in terms of learning experiences, in terms of assessment, in terms of uh, uh, intelligent systems, tutoring systems, in terms of being able to adapt according to different uh, needs of the students, individual students. So, uh, and of course, immersive learning, etc. Uh, above all, there's a lot of emphasis nowadays on what we call personalized platforms, personalized learning platforms. So, the University of the Future actually is building up on all this technology, but these hopefully new ones that will come on stream. I mean, Quantum computing is a good example. Uh, but yes, all these things, Education 4.0, all these things hopefully you are already applying. I can see there are two machines of 3D printing. I have one as well at home. Um, 3D printing, 4D printing, 5D printing, up to 8D printing. There are, you know, can go 4D printing with Tesseracts up to modular printing. So incredible the amount of, uh, and in fact, for depending on the faculty, depending on course for like engineering, etc., they're actually using a lot of uh, um, additive manufacturing and 3D printing, etc. Um, chatbots, uh, virtual, digital twins. I mean, you know, I remember that sort of last year I gave some talks in, in Europe, and a lot of people, even managers, didn't know much. Heard nowadays they are actually searching and very keen on digital twins. So, you know, virtually modeling, whatever it is, a process, a manufacturing process, a plant, a new product using virtual twins and digital twins. And that is actually very, very important. We can do that as well in terms of the universities. Um, so, again, we have a lot of these AI assisted technologies coming on stream and actually changing the world or the way we teach, etc. Um, and this, I actually believe, that also helps us to develop critical thinking skills on the student body. Um, <coughs> language models like the chat GPT, etc. Um, they are, I mean, lots of people are actually using that. Um, uh, I actually gave an example because you know, he was uh, uh, an academic from Pakistan. He actually did his PhD and he's teaching at the Southern Denmark University and he actually does a lot of papers based on chat GTP. Uh, this is an issue about, you know, disclosure, academic ethics and all that. That's a different thing we can talk at the end. But no doubts that is actually helping to generating code, content, structure, syntax, and also well, shifting the curriculum that we are actually using at universities, curriculum design, and of course the learning objectives. And the assignments. We need to move more and more towards a different type of formative assessment and not summative assessment. Um, so technological transformation is actually bringing a new landscape, completely different landscape. Uh, micro learning, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, augmented reality, blended reality, uh, collaborative reality, you know, in terms of uh, 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 um, what you call um, centered reality individually for personal learning environments. All that is actually coming. And even blockchain as well. It terms of preserve the integrity of academic research. I'll, I'll mention that at the end. Uh, so a lot of changes. It's an example of one. It's actually from Wiley. Uh, machine learning algorithm, Newton, uh, allows users to de deliver personalized educational content. You can tailor the tool to the particular content that you are pr providing, taking into account individual needs of students and the learning style. Again, um, is an example of how a platform can is actually leveraging the benefits of AI. Uh, tutoring systems as well, uh, huge uh, uh, adoption nowadays, having these uh, technological marvels, which uh, again shift towards more personalized, adaptive, engaging education, etc. Um, anyone is actually using these sort of tutoring systems here? AI? You no? Know? 
But again, there are, I, I, I had lots and lots of examples I gave in that seminar, but I mentioned two or three. Of the, uh, yeah, later on, I will mention some of these. Uh, one of the main objectives uh, in terms of these AI for teaching purposes is to create what I call uh, learning paths, adaptive learning paths. So we can create these learning paths that actually, in a dynamic way, adjust uh, the content to the progress and the learning style and the progress and the how much are they actually taking on the knowledge, etc. But in fact, it's not strictly because we don't want knowledge hoarding. What we know is sharing the knowledge. Okay? We want to create value with them. I mean, I do that for many, many years. I mean, I've not, I've not taught undergraduate students for 40 years or something like that. But masters and also PhD students and also staff, um, I do learning by discovery all the time, even before artificial intelligence. I want them to learn side by side with me and for me to learn from them, learning by discovery. And this is actually also good uh, to ensure that the students receive a sort of tailored uh, um, product in terms of what we want to work with them, with them. Um, uh, so this will enhance their learning journal. Uh, feedback assessment as well. We can use uh, some of the uh, artificial intelligence tutoring systems to provide feedback to the students. Uh, clearly pinpoint and identified areas where they actually can improve, areas of improvement. And this is a new mindset in terms of teaching. Um, well, I mean, you know, we need to change completely. A lot of students are using AI. People are saying, oh my God, I'm actually worried about that. Well, you can actually work on that. Either you say, oh, uh, I have to use a lot of Bing, I use a lot of Bard, etc. So I know more or less, so I can tell when the student actually pre presents an essay based on artificial intelligence. But maybe it's the wrong psychology. You need to go with them and to allow them to do that and quiz them and, and analyze them in terms of what can you give beyond this that you just show, which is actually based on uh, a large language model. So uh, different sort of system. So uh, there are ethical considerations as well we need to take into, into account. Um, address private, privacy, data privacy, etc. Um, we spoke about alternative credentials more and more, and some of more classical universities, traditional universities, both in Europe and also in America, are actually side by side developing these uh, alternative credentials, micro badges, online certifications, etc. Virtual reality, augmented reality, you know anyway, uh, is very good for simulating experiments. And by the way, because of the time frame, uh, then Sarah will give you copies of all this stuff to everybody. You can actually read uh, more closely the content, etc. Um, more and more technology based, obviously, assisted through artificial intelligence, play a very significant role. But also, you need to be careful about the issue about diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, etc. So, uh, education that is accessible. Um, one of the things that actually happened three days ago in Britain was a number of universities are actually low, um, lowering the standards of entry because of the money that they make for foreign students. So for the British, they keep exactly the same. In England, 9,000 or whatever, uh, you know, masters, you know, 25, 30,000. Uh, but for instance, for an undergraduate, instead of having a university like Edinburgh or like mine, Glasgow, uh, AABB, or whatever, and they start lowering A, B, C, C, or, you know, lowering, but they want to 28,000. Um, it's, uh, again, it's an ethical issue, um, and they are losing track. They are losing as well. So we need to be very, very careful about that. Um, obviously, artificial intelligence can actually hope, uh, uh, help as well on the, what we call open educational resources, the university. Um, a lot of machine learning, a lot of personalized uh, learning recommendations can, can actually be uh, uh, coming out as an output. And we have also a possibility to, to improve what we call competency-based uh, education. So uh, in terms, of, as I told you, uh, we are moving towards competency-based education where students uh, are based on their mastery of specific skills, vertically uh, specialization, competence, uh, as compared to traditional ones to be assessed. So it's more flexible, much more efficient, etc. Technology is changing, so obviously, um, again, as I mentioned to you, is 
mainly because of this generation, especially Generation Z. We're talking about Generation Z was born in 2000 at, at the turn of the century and Generation Alpha 2010. Uh, and then, of course, COVID uh, just four years ago, resilient. And these people are completely different. So um, we, we cannot have education 4.0 um, or, or sorry, uh, generations 4.0 with education 2.0, obviously. We cannot do that. Um, and all sorts of things. Robotics as well. I mean, you know, are we going to see more and more robotic telepresence in terms of uh, our classrooms? Are we going to have more robots as well? Or can we have actually virtual reality uh, but through, towards, to, to, through uh, robotic telepresence? Yes, why not? Um, Virtual reality, we spoke a lot about these. Um, you can explore all sorts of things, either manufacturing plant or um, automated warehouses or whatever, everything towards virtual reality. Uh, so again, chatbots, interesting, depends very much on the ethical issues about the knowledge base, obviously the inference logic, because you can actually use this. I'm not talking about normal chatbots like domestic ones, Alexa's in Google Home or Panasonic J10. Uh, I'm talking about more advanced chat box. You can actually use it at university. But then, uh, what is knowledge base? Huge knowledge base sometimes. Um, uh, what are the sources? Are they correct? Are they accurate? So what is the sort of recommendations that they're actually providing, etc.? So they, they, it's like if you're using, you know, uh, machine learning, you reach the point of using deep learning and you use either recurrent neural networks or convolutional neural networks, sometimes the output is actually wrong. Uh, and then when you look at, uh, I mean, I, I, I started working on neural networks in 1990 uh, when I was in Cardiff. I've got also two books on neural networks. Uh, I only use one hidden layer. I mean, Google uses 22 hidden layers. ChatGPT uses 96 hidden layers. Um, again, but sometimes, you know, is, is the, the output hallucinating? Are they, do they have the right sources? I'll give us the right. So we need to be very careful about some of these things. Um, technology, higher education, but there are a number of other things that uh, people speak less about it, but they are interesting. I mean, in you know, holography, um, do you know what is holography? No? Holograms? Yes, a laser beam. Yeah. Um, that's interesting as well. You see, you know, people don't talk a lot about that, but we can actually have, you know, based on cryptography, we can actually have holography as well as uh, tenets of the delivering a particular content. Um, uh, also, um, so a lot of virtual learning environments come on stream, and, uh, and this can be actually integrated with face to face learning as a case of a complementarity. Uh, chat box, obviously, um, smart chat box, a new generation as well. Um, you can actually have smart box per subject, per area, per domain, personalized learning again. Um, and that is actually int interesting as well, the amount. Um, how many of you actually have chat box for teaching or chat box at home? No? So it's not very popular in... No, but you, yours is a Scottish uh, halfway, half-baked... No, you do, and you, you actually interact a lot with chatbot? Not a lot, but I do. I use it for writing academic writing purposes. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So it's it more of the gadget as, as opposed. And writing email, so it's like yeah. I design my own, transcribe yeah. my own email, yeah. and then just send it to the chatbot. And then <laughs> 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 well, it depends very much on the realm of application, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, if you're dealing with some research or academic content, uh, you know, sophisticated, but maybe it's not appropriate. But there are a number of new advanced chat boxes that's coming on stream as well, virtual agencies. Um, we're going to see more and more what you call IVAs, intelligent virtual agents, which scour the internet looking for something that you are looking for. So either you have platforms in terms of artificial intelligence, I'm going to talk a lot uh, about those. Uh, you can have IRIS, you can have uh, 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 a number of them, chat doc, etc. Uh, or you can actually have that uh, on the internet. Um, one interesting thing is about, you know, the issue about cognitive computing and, you know, effective computing and pattern computing. Um, I don't know any example of a university that actually is using that at the moment, but that's certainly for the future. Uh, can we use in pattern computing to analyze the state, the mood, the state of mind of the students and to adjust according to that? I think so, based on spatial coding, 
based on biometric signals, uh, based on heart rate variability. So I think it's possible, but uh, at the moment it's still lagging behind in terms of application. Um, da -da -da, this was, so we, 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 we are changing the, the, the word intelligence. It's changing so fast. It's, you know, um, future intelligence is a far richer concept nowadays. You know, uh, it's not about academic knowledge, it's not about IQ tests, uh, etc. It's something like, especially, is the interaction between human and machine, is the complementarity, is, you know, we're talking about intellects on both sides. We've still not reached the singularity stage, but some people are saying that we're by the end of this decade, uh, most likely 2050. Um, uh, we're going to have general in artificial intelligence, and maybe uh, towards the end of this century, we might have, you know, advanced um, super intelligence. So, but there are already. I mean, I mentioned here two, two, two examples which I know well. One is called Century Tech, another one is called Alelo, that use big data and artificial intelligence to provide engaging, involving, personalized learning for students. And obviously with the feedback for the lectures, uh, very interesting. So, of course, for data analytics and personalized learning as well, um, you can have, actually have and gain a lot of valuable information, valuable data on the performance of the students, uh, the ones that are struggling, the ones that need really help. Uh, so adaptive learning based on technology is also another area of interest. And a lot of learning analytics that are appearing as well. So either in terms of curriculum design or in terms of uh, uh, the prediction of students, if the student, he or she, will do well, less well, etc. So all these analytics are important and can be actually gained from some of these platforms. And of course, remedial work, tutoring work, uh, um, tutorials, uh, tut tutoring work that can actually be after that. This is one that I, is very interesting, the EdTech Lab using machine learning and data analytics to look for patterns and patterns of movement of data and to predict learning outcomes. That is a very interesting one. Uh, obviously, just as an indicator, just as an indicator. So all sorts of analytics, you know, um, that's another area like uh, cryptography or holography that is still not widely used in universities of the future, but for me it's very important. Sensor technology. At the moment we have about one trillion sensors in the world. Sensor technology applied to the learning environment at the University of the Future are seen to predict success of the students, to measure achievement of learning outcomes, could be, again, very, very effective. Um, I think that, yes, I mean, we might have the emergence of personal learning agents, which can combine, I mean, one of the techniques has been lagging behind, and we've been talking about that for at least seven or eight years now, which is semantic web. Uh, but the semantic web and having a whole uh, sort of a chain of uh, meanings uh, combined with tags. And of course, this web, the concept of semantic web combined can be actually a very good element to have a personalized learning agent. Um, so emergence of these personal learning agents that can actually help the students and to have a stream of difficulties and stream of content delivery all the time. Um, so we talk about self-paced learning uh, uh, which is very important as well. The students more and more learn at their own speed. Uh, they are the masters, they actually decide what to do. Um, so more, better understanding, etc. Um, no code tools. I mean, you know, nowadays, can uh, students or some students actually develop their own artificial intelligence platforms? Especially with nowadays, there is a low code or no code uh, possibilities. Yes. With their, these technologies are actually democratizing um, access to the power and enabling people that are not very technical, uh, they don't need to program and to automate AI models without writing a single line of code. Um, optics as well. Uh, Sarah, what are optics? I need to change the uh, battery. <coughs> uh, okay. I, it never happened to me, but now I've got to... I, I had a, a kind of primary infection when I was one year old and they gave me streptomycin and affected my ear. So this ear is completely dead. And I, I, I'm talking to you, I can listen even without, but I was advised in Scotland to use something to help me 
especially when an uh, environment where there are many people and talking and all that. So, Sarah asked him what are optics and are just going to change the battery. This never happened to me, but, you know, I'm very transparent, very transparent. Hello there. Just to change this. Any, any, any feedback uh, about the session so far? Anyone? Right. And it's all about the mentality of it. How are we actually looking at AI? Because uh, the first response was that why, why should we allow students to have uh, AI-generated uh, stuff submitted as assignments? But if we look at it, we should actually design our components in a way that goes beyond what they can generate from AI, right? So anybody wants to share uh, how would they have actually dealt with um, AI and how, actually, yeah, yeah. Just to share an experience, yesterday I was talking to HEC guys and the question they asked, one of the main questions they asked was, how would you determine if the, if the text written by a student or a thesis would be uh, written by AI or uh, it's by them? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure about uh, uh, the present state, but I answered that at the moment there is no way actually to tell. There was, but uh, previously, but at the moment I'm not aware because the text generated by AI is so smart that we can, human intelligence can only judge, but the, as far as tools are concerned, perhaps uh, we are struggling. So maybe Dr. Adnan uh, is trying to tell something. So. Ajit, thank you for this very, very interesting perspective. Uh, I would like to chip in from the CS perspective. That's very uh, often we have assignments which are codes. So the students have to write codes. And in that sense, it's actually sometimes easier to, to spot that it is an AI-generated code. Just yesterday, I had given an assignment uh, to my GSF, a graduate student fellow. And he brought me a piece of code. The, the task was very simple, to convert an RGB image to a grayscale image. And he, have, of course, used ChatGPT to do that. And in one or two questions, I could spot that he doesn't know it yet. That I just said, OK, this line of code, what it does? Do you know it? And then the end was blank. So, so the reliance from students' side excessively on, on these tools is actually sometimes uh, a problematic problem for us that are they really learning or, or they're just trying to bring in a solution to make the professor happy. So, uh, yeah. Did a good job? Yes, I think so. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry for changing the, the, no, that's all right. the battery anyway. <laughs> so, aptic comes from the Greek, you know, uh, the sense of touch comes, aptic uh, means to touch. And uh, in certain disciplines of the university as well, the touching, the feeling actually could actually be very, very beneficial. And uh, again, I know one or two universities actually are now in, in developing applications on the optic technology, but I think it will be interesting something. And in fact, in other case, that I don't know, uh, ultra optics, mid-air, okay? You can feel something mid-air, incredible. That's ultra optics. Again, that are technologies, that are emerging technologies that actually be uh, with possible applications for the university of the future. Uh, augmentation, I mean, I'm talking about just uh, 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 hacking, biohacking, and all that. But nowadays, I mean, I'm not talking about uh, um, we can have new tropics, we can have, you know, all sorts of things too. Cognitive augmentation is very important for the universities. You can have transcranial magnetic stimulation. I can stimulate Sarah's brain. Okay, would you like that? <laughs> you don't need that. You are very bright. Well, you, you might need that. Uh, so, anyway, uh, but all sorts of, uh, we might actually have. Uh, a number of cyborgs uh, attending the university in um, five years from now. Because in de facto we are, you know, more and more um, X amount biology, X amount of technology. You might actually 85% biology, 15% technology. Uh, you've been repaired by a number of things. One of the things that actually more highly developed in terms of medicine is called nanobots. Nanobots. So these na micro nanobots, they actually travel to your arteries to repair parts of your body. Incredible. So again, uh, interesting the rise of augmentation in higher education. In terms of academic research, I just put here a snapshot of the seminar I gave to the, the academics. Um, yes, a, a number of things. I 
because I've been dealing with this, I mean, I would say that about 80% of the applications of AI for academic research, about 80% deals with the, the body of knowledge literature review. Okay? Uh, the other 20%, yes, could be modeling, research questions, research hypotheses, could be data collection, data analysis. But the bulk is about uh, literature review, which could be, be a big help. Because I remember I had, uh, um, uh, some years ago, a doctoral student from Taiwan actually, uh, good, I'm not talking about peripheral, silly, 1,000 references in his PhD. So can you see the amount of reading? Uh, but a good PhD, there is no counter. I mean, I would see, as an external examiner, uh, 300, 400. But nowadays, uh, with all this technology, you can actually reduce, become much more effective, productive, because of all these platforms. So, yes, it's changing the academic landscape. Um, seismic shifts appearing in terms of generative artificial intelligence helping academics. Um, huge impact. Uh, there are some issues about obvious limitations, uh, language proficiency, etc. And some people are not very uh, keen on that, especially in terms of reviewers, peer reviewing, etc. They are not very keen. keen. But no doubt, in terms of saving time and uh, becoming more and more efficient, uh, artificial intelligence as applied to academic research is actually helping. Uh, big data as well, proliferation of data. I mean, it's just unbelievable nowadays. I mean, no, this is actually, I'll, I'll come back to, to something else. We're talking about, you know, um, 15 zeros, 18 zeros. I believe that certainly in about three, four years from now, we're going to enter the realm of yottabytes. So at the moment, we're talking about zettabytes. Yottabytes, 21 zeros. Uh, incredible, but more and more people in terms of data, we are digits, we are a combination of digits, you know. That's why there is now a counter movement in academia to say, you know, let's complement that with little data, small data, maybe using phenomenological research, maybe using ethnographic research to complement because otherwise you are 10 digits, 0, 0, 0, 2, 3, 4, 0, 0. Would you like to be that? <laughs> no, you want to be Sarah from Exeter. Uh, so, and one of the things I've been talking when I start working on this future of universe some years ago is, uh, and now is even worse, the transformation. I mean, a student that starts a university degree, first year, okay, leading towards whatever. Uh, things are changing, the objectives, the problems, the technology, the solutions. By the time they reach year three, by the, you know, it's completely different. It's totally a waste of time. In the PhD, the same thing. What do you mean, traditional, you know, division stage, uh, uh, literature review, the bulk, and then, of course, conceptual model, the research question, da -da -da, research design, da -da, and then writing up. My God, you did that PhD, we did use those constructs, subconstructs, after you submit and you have your viva, obsolete. Obsolete. Did nothing. Complete changes. So we need to rethink about exactly all these issues. Blockchain is very interesting because it provides data security as well. Um, could improve in terms of data security and also integrity, to preserve the integrity of academic research, ensuring not only the credibility but also the reproducibility. Uh, smart language models, yeah, you know, people talk about that, everybody talks about OpenAI, Microsoft, etc. but um, uh, they are coming on stream more and more huge amount. Um, how many of you actually read the issues that are appearing in the States? Because this is a American environment. Yes? American environment. Not British. Let alone Scots. Uh, um, next time I come, I'll bring a Scottish flag there. Eh? Yeah, of course. I mean, what's this? I mean, yeah. Uh, but the issue is that, uh, that uh, uh, I was talking about uh, the, the, the smart and the language models and all that. New York Times, they are suing OpenAI because a lot of these large language models, okay, uh, they are using data, whatever, from newspapers, from other media sources. Um, and of course you need to ask, you know, a lot of the recommendations, apart from the type lag, you know, if you're using ChatGPT 3.5, they always give you time lag, okay, up to last year, a year ago. Da -da 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 -da. 
So, but apart from that, what about the sources? What about the citations? What about the, how can I, is the system hallucinating? Is it credible? Can I take decisions? So again, you need to be very, very careful. Um, okay, hypothesis, yes, you can actually, very interesting, you can actually use as well artificial intelligence to help you, uh, uh, you know, sort of generating a research questions, hypothesis, and even to design experimental research. Um, if you identify patterns within the data and trends, uh, sometimes this is difficult or almost impossible to do, but you can actually help uh, with, with, uh, with artificial intelligence. You can actually filter and screen uh, and to have a much more uh, better output. Um, useful, yes, uh, you know, we can actually writing a book, writing a research grant, etc. All these tools correct your English can actually help you a lot. So a lot of benefits in terms of using artificial intelligence in academic research. Uh, more and more as well, when they give you some advice or they give you some suggestions, you can critically think about your work. You can actually think, well, shall I go back, uh, etc. Um, so and this happens as well with the, when you submit to a journal and you get some, some reviews and say, you know, how am I going to address these issues? Am I doing the right thing? Uh, I mentioned that at the end. So. ChatGPT, a lot of people are using that. I mean, yes, you can have a number of sites. Brainstorming, generate an outline, tell, tell ChatGPT, your topic is that, ask for sources, describe a specific idea, ask for examples, and of course, come up with citations. Uh, very pretty much a basic framework. Um, again, uh, interesting, this is the example from this, uh, your compatriots, uh, Bilan. Um, very interesting because he actually is, he, so he's a postdoc at uh, uh, Denmark, University of Southern Denmark, and actually used ChatGPT, and he said that actually saved him a lot. Interact with the machine uh, to give ideas, and more or less the framework for a good uh, research article for a journal was came out for the ChatGPT. Was very happy with this. Um, could actually use a ChatGPT for a PhD thesis. Well, bits, you know, uh, contextual research introduction, etc., but certainly not for certain areas. So be, be very careful. Uh, introduction, statement, uh, background information, yes. And there are a number of platforms. I mean, if you actually combine Google Scholar with ChatGPT, this is a good example. So, well, maybe you end up with consensus. So you can actually ask consensus about, and this is important, when you're building your conceptual model, you've got constructs, subconstructs, you've got interrelationships, and you can ask consensus, what are the, you know, probable, uh, most likely interrelationship between these constructs and concepts? And more than that, what is causality? Uh, if you are actually using some kind of, as an objective, cause and effect. So this is interesting in, the, in this area. Um, a number of research assistants, um, artificial intelligence based, are actually appearing. Mostly based on LLP, natural language processing, but it's not just natural language processing, it's generation, classification, processing, understanding, NL, several things. But it's interesting, and a number of them, of course, elicit its uh, good one. Um, they actually call them, we, this is D1, the research system artificial intelligence, uh, language model, uh, huge uh, knowledge base. Uh, what is interesting is that they claim, and apparently it's, to a certain point it's true, that through this platform, you can actually establish intelligent conversations with, uh, uh, with uh, in this case, with the platform, with the software. Minerva is also widely used. Minerva is actually a, a, a well-known one. Uh, they claim that it is the most advanced uh, in the world, the most advanced virtual research assistant. Uh, a lot of capabilities. Um, one thing that I like about this one is that the answers that they give can be verified. Uh, and that is a very important issue. Uh, Zotero is a baseline, yes, I mean, you know, 10,000 citation styles, format, uh, pretty much the database can help you collect, organize, uh, design researches, but it's kind of a, a baseline one. Mirror thing, again, interesting as well. Um, you can have the power of artificial intelligence. Uh, lots of questions about scientific methods, methodology, methods, um, you know, about uh, papers. Uh, and of course, this is based on GTP, GTP4, uh, if you are willing to pay the $20 or whatever a month. Um, Research Rabbit is also well known, an incredible tool, very fast. Um, 
they call it the Spotify of research, academic research, the Spotify. Um, yes, you can add academic papers to sort of uh, mental files, in this case what they call collections, collections, very interesting. Um, it, depending on your interests and your areas, of course. They can make recommendations as well. Um, and of course, there is a kind of a scientometrics, web metrics, because they show authors in terms of mapping. They will show you a graph with that. <coughs> literature review, so automating more and more. Big help by automating literature review. Um, this is one example. Uh, ant um, anthropic uh, constitutional AI is uh, mainly to help in terms of these repetitive transcribing interviews if you're using qualitative research, which is a pain. Even if you use something like uh, En Vivo, it's very non-user friendly. Um, automated literature review, again, generative AI can actually help you a lot, uh, summarizing the key findings, etc. Um, the same thing with using JAT, uh, GTP, DOC, they can actually summarize and put uh, you give the URL of a particular paper or a particular journal article and they actually can summarize very well. Um, that's, the, that's the example. I actually use this sometimes. It's very, very useful chat, uh, 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 chat doc. Very quick, very efficient in terms of providing very, very summaries, very good summaries with a lot of good insights. Um, so the most important elements that are drawn out from the papers or the articles. Uh, scholarship is also now the improving academic research by automating, reading, summarizing. All these, as I told you, 80% is based on bodies of knowledge, literature review, etc. Uh, to help you with the re literature review process. Research, I had an another one. Uh, can actually organize your work, navigate through different documents. Uh, again, they claim uh, that, you know, they deal with about 5,000 research papers, at least 20,000 answers are provided. Uh, but yes, it's, it's quite comprehensive, this one. Uh, so again, these are examples. There are many, many more, but are just the same examples. Now, can we actually use AI to help you generate the research hypothesis? Yes, very much so. Uh, you can analyze existing data, identify patterns, movements of data, and even uh, suggest and then clarify and, uh, you know, uh, analyze if they accept your hypothesis, meaning uh, based on the information that you have. So it's a kind of uh, information buddy that you are using to throw back uh, at you a number of ideas. Um, new hypotheses, all these, again, this anthropic constitutional AI is again used for generating hypotheses. Um, what is important, this particular one is because they are concerned about ethical grounds. So they are tell you, wait a minute, Yes, this is an hypothesis that you might use related to your thematic realm of your research, but can be unethical, but can be dangerous, but can be illegal, etc. So that sort of a boundary is an interesting feature of this particular program. Um, again, it's, it's really generating a generative AI, uh, changing completely the landscape of academic research. Yes, uh, uh, in terms of minimizing time, tasks, providing valuable insights, etc. Um, and, and all stages, literature review, research design, modeling, generation of, uh, of hypothesis, data analysis, uh, re references, etc. Um, this is interesting because it's one area that is actually starting now AI, uh, is the issue about research design. So can we actually use AI to plan your research and to help you uh, designing your research process? Yes, you know, it's a kind of automation of your research design. Um, very interesting, and uh, it's still early days, very embryonic, but more and more we see some uh, companies developing software in this area. Uh, data analysis, of course, I mean, I'm <laughs> for 20 years or so, I did a lot of uh, statistical modeling courses with uh, a young uh, uh, mathematician from the University of Manchester, worked with me, we have three books together, and we gave courses, whatever. Uh, Hungary, Slovenia, whatever, uh, universities. In the first 10 years, we are prisoners of SPSS, which is pretty much Pakistani, and which is, my God, okay? Um, especially in terms of ethical behavior of researchers, you know, uh, you have a huge amount of missing data. SPSS gives you mean values, and you present, I mean, are you an ethical researcher? You know that you've got huge amount of missing data. This software does this, and you present your results. 
Anyway, we abandoned that after 10 years and uh, uh, in the last few years we only use R. We actually bring the R to the students and all the, 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 the environment that we use is based on R. Uh, and then, well, we had uh, four different applications, I mean, for neural networks, everything. Um, so, but again, but you can actually use as well artificial intelligence for data analysis as well, for the interpretation. Um, so it can be, be suitable. One, one of the most widely recognized uh, uh, AI platforms for data analysis is called Tableau. Uh, very powerful. Uh, you have a very easy drag and drop uh, interface. And uh, interesting because in all the data, you can actually create tree maps, heat maps, etc. can be very useful. Um, again, so AI can be used to generate and to analyze data. You simply ask, you know, what is the best way to collect data? In enter your tropic. Uh, what is the best software? Da, da, da. Can you help uh, get this data? Because well, synthetic data, because more and more we're using synthetic data uh, as opposed to real data. So again, uh, a number of questions and you get lots of answers, lots of guidelines for your research. And of course, you know, especially if you don't have in a particular domain of research, if you don't have data, artificial intelligence can help you because more and more we've got these one shot, few zero shot learning models that if you don't have a lot of data information, they can actually help you. Uh, you can ask also a full stack uh, uh, deep learning, which goes everything from starting uh, in terms of uh, developing the problem statement up to data collection processing, training of the model, deployment, etc. Um, is it time to have a more data centric uh, artificial intelligence? Yes, I think so. I think we need to focus more and more on the quality of the data fueling. Um, so clearly data centric AI is very, very important. And there are some systems as well, the issue about distribution, because we are assuming that the data set has a similar distribution. Nowadays with this system, for instance, these uh, uh, two deep learning, two DL, even if they are separate dis distributions, uh, you can actually use them, and this is very, very good improvement. Um, again, visualization, as you know, it's very important nowadays, more and more. Data analysis is based on visualization. You can actually use as well a number of uh, GTP4 uh, actually does that. There's also a program very interesting for artificial intelligence base for data visualization. It's called Julius. Julius. Um, this will help you as well identify hidden patterns, movements of data, etc., and can guide your research. Simulation modeling as well, you know, generative AI can actually help you to model, to simulate as well. So, you, especially when you have a complex problem or a complex nature of the problem, uh, this can actually help you a lot uh, by searching for the underlying processes of that particular research process. Uh, reference as well, I mean, you know, it will help with references, especially in some journals are very cumbersome in terms of asking for Harvard or American Psychological Association, and these platforms immediately transform your reference, etc. Um, feedback peer review as well, you know, you can see as well uh, artificial intelligence, genera generative artificial intelligence as a collaborator of your research. So, uh, is machine assisted research, this platform, for instance, hey, science offer very good feedback, uh, ensuring a scholar's work resonates with what the academic community is expecting. Um, this is interesting. I mean, I only know one example, but it's very interesting. So artificial intelligence based to, okay, what shall we expect? We just submitted the paper. How are the review is going to, 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 to react? Uh, so how can we predict the feedback from the reviewers? Very, very interesting. Um, and the special, is he a skeptical reviewer? A very difficult, is the journal? So again, to detect the problems in the scientific arena, etc. again, you can actually have re reviewed feedback. Again, very, very interesting, these platforms uh, to predict feedback. Um, I mean, I do it because in last month in Tunisia, they asked me specifically to do something on management and marketing, etc. But again, um, a lot of data, a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also the issue about entrepreneurship, innovation. Uh, there are all important areas for scientific research in these two domains. Uh, ethics, very, very important. Question, how this will affect the originality, the creativity? Because that's one of the things that differentiates us 
algorithms from human rhythms. Um, people are concerned about, you know, uh, how can I avoid plagiarism as well? Um, so we need to raise these questions. Uh, so do we have to disclose that we're using artificial intelligence? Yes. Very short answer, yes. Uh, so can you list AI tools in the references? Yes. OK. Uh, so we need to analyze. Um, we need to make sure that you know the issue about the, the, the algorithmic tools in general, they do not meet the criteria of authorship, because some people try to put ChatGPT as an author, co-author of a paper. No. But reference, yes. Uh, disclosure, yes. And of course, l last thing is you know the academic disclosure, gen gen generative, uh, generative artificial intelligence is transforming academic research definitely, uh, scholarly writing definitely. But there are ethical concerns; they will remain there. And the consensus is that yes, you should always disclose uh, that we're using artificial intelligence in your publications. And that's it. Final anecdote at the end, as usual. Are you concerned about the increase in artificial intelligence? No. I'm concerned about the decrease in real intelligence. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here and inviting me. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, any issues? Actually, just, just a comment. So you um, commented regarding the using chat GPT for the thesis. We have to be very careful because that information is being shared. So True. if you are writing a thesis or any paper that has a component that has not been peer reviewed and you're going for publication yeah. or something, that those ideas can sip, those ideas could be shared with other people. So if you share can a chat GPT, they will and they could end up. So someone else searches something similar to you, they might end up your knowing your algorithm. True. So we have to be very careful how we're using. You need to establish verifiers and boundaries, definitely. And that's why we need to educate our, edu our students yes. also, because they are using these technologies much more than we are using those technologies. Um, so that's that was the point. Very good. Yeah, you should, the, all those precautions should be taken. So actually, um, from the future university's perspective, I'm a little concerned about. Uh, the uh, as we are increasing uh, the applications of AI in universities, uh, the physical universities are shrinking and more cyber universities are there. So I'm more concerned about the development of uh, student personalities, which is one of the role of universities. Mm -hmm. So uh, which a student learns by, which we call embodied intelligence. I mean, being present in a particular situation. How do you think that this would affect how these personality development, the interaction between two physical, I mean, uh, the physical interaction between two persons and the learning of from that interaction, would that be replaced by AI? Uh, yeah. Can be replaced, yeah, yeah, sure. but we need to give the options, you know. Mm -hmm. People, you know, uh, either being young people or more mature postgraduate students, they have a choice. And we might have more and more a kind of micro learning and chunks of education, meaning that, you, you know, in a particular course, of course, you need to have some uh, critical mass. Uh, but you say, okay, do you want how, what is the percentage you don't want face to face? And percentage online. And per you can negotiate this either by course, by subject, etc. And but, but the students have the choice and can say, in terms of personality, only then by analyzing and applying a learning environment. To be okay. After all, this one is a bit deviating. He's become an old liar. We need to help, etc. So, there be mechanisms. But um, artificial intelligence can actually create a lot of ways to impart knowledge, to gain knowledge, to have reciprocal change of knowledge with the students. Because the students nowadays, you know, uh, go to the classroom and they know sometimes in certain areas or facets of the area more than the lecturer. Uh, in terms of illustrations, in terms of examples, in terms of applicability, etc. So we need to be careful. But I say that, you know, chunks of learning, micro learning, uh, embedded with technology should be a way. Then the issue about how, as you mentioned, the personality. Uh, 
uh, we can have personas. We can decide, okay, we're going to have, based on our experience, let's say for this particular course, this degree, etc., uh, we're going to have this typology of people, of students, and now this typology. Uh, we can then actually then subdivide them and say, okay, uh, for this typology, I can actually offer a micro-credential, uh, a badge. Um, so it depends very much, but that's a good question. Right. Uh, building on Dr. Adnan's uh, comments, uh, the role uh, due to the uh, presence of AI and the increased use of AI by students, the role of uh, academicians, teachers, is attenuating. I mean, is what? Attenuating, uh, becoming less yes, and less. Yes, yes, yes. And in fact, it's changing dr drastically. So what do you think, from your experience, what should be the role now in the... Uh, a catalyst. A catalyst. You should be a catalyst there to help, catalyst involvement, knowledge, guidance. You should be uh, a kind of a, a person to help, personal helper. So uh, you cannot really have, uh, we're not talking about knowledge hoarding. This is what I want you to learn, that, 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 that we're going to have a test uh, in two months' time. No, uh, you need to take a different attitude, a different state of mind. But I would say a guider, a candidate, uh, learning and teaching, learning by discovery, number of roles. Hello. Yes, so thank you very much. Did you much do a PhD for... in Britain, in Scotland? <laughs> no, 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 I did PhD from Pakistan. Ah, okay. So, so thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. So, so I think we need to learn more about all the software packages and all the helping yeah. tools okay. yeah. that, uh, that are available to support teachers and as well as students. Yes. Right, and uh, as I work as a reviewer for many conferences, Yeah. And they now take an oath that you will not use any any of the artificial intelligence-based thing to generate your review. So we have to read papers and write reviews at our own. Okay, that's a kind of a first stage of having fear because they should be more open-minded, etc. But uh, uh, sorry, finish uh, the yes. author. Yes, thank you, thank you. Ah, okay. Uh, first of all, I'll be delighted because this was a very uh, condensed short presentation I did based on what Adnan asked me uh, yesterday, um, just for you, bespoke for you. Uh, but if you really want to have this PowerPoint that I developed uh, on AI for academic research, with lots and lots of platforms, lots of different things, please ask Salman and ask, or ask Professor uh, uh, Rizwana to give you a copy or I'll give you a copy and you'll find lots and lots of these things, okay? This was only a snapshot, a snapshot. Uh, the issue about, yes, if you are reviewing for academic conference as well, if they are fearful of using some of these artificial intelligence uh, assisted technologies, uh, I think that is a normal reaction at the very inception of the technologies because it's unknown to them. Um, if they, yes, I mean, plagiarism, but if they actually, have an ethical behavior as researchers, as human beings, and then, you know, disclose what they use, which fractions they use, at what stages of the paper development. I think that is actually an open policy that can actually be very, very healthy. Um, so I have no problems with that. Obviously, um, I need to know, but sometimes people know, especially people that already know some of these platforms, people that know more or less some of these AI-assisted uh, technologies, you know more or less you can see. But we need to change completely the, I don't mind to have a, a student that did an essay. I mean, I just now gave an MBA course for the University of Piraeus in Greece, okay? And if they've got very good, I can detect very good final essays. Um, I say, okay, now this is it. It's good, it's quite good, quite good. Uh, now defend, and I want to go beyond what you just written, because it was not you, or 70% was not you. Now go beyond that, explain, dissect this. I have ways to find out, okay? Do you, yeah. Oh, Time for one there is, is there watching me awesome. and on, controlling me. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so uh, what I was thinking from your presentation was, um, so you talked about diversity and background diversity mm -hmm. as well and the um, analysis and uh, assessment methods, automatic assessment yeah. methods and personalized learning experience as well based on these technologies. Um, 
Do you think there is a case where maybe there is going, you know, in a near future, maybe, um, a case for rise of kind of classism or sectarianism based on um, financial backgrounds? A university, for example, that charges around sixty thousand uh, dollars, upwards of sixty thousand yeah. dollars a piece, they, they can probably offer all of these schools freely to their students, and um, and and the university that charges about a thousand dollars a year. Yeah. It'll probably be a very good question. Screw, and, right? and more and more, one of the trends that we see in the future is subscription based education. Right. So you don't pay the $50,000, whatever. You pay by subscription. And you take from the portfolio this and this and this. And depending on the mode of delivery, this will cost you X, Y, and Z. Right. So that is the, pretty much the, the trend for the future. Again, it's aligned with micro credentials, with budgets, and all that. But Education by subscription, yeah. Good question. Thank you so much. So much. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Asnan. Thank you so much for your time. No question your... from you. Oh. <laughs> I'm they just asked, teasing you. Yeah, they've just asked my questions. So <laughs> these are all my questions. Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, such a wonderful and thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, thank Pleasure. you very much, Professor Luis. Um, it's been really kind of you to come here in morning and deliver a talk. And, and so spend six hours putting this together. Yes, yes, of course. That's really incredible of you. you. Yes, thank you very much. Pleasure, so, pleasure. Uh, just a souvenir that would remind you. Yeah. Of I Information Technology University. Yes, 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 so yes Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. So this is this is for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure.